Mickey Thompson's name is synonymous with speed. He is developing two new cars for the Indianapolis Speedway where he will try them out this year. 98 cars are entered at Indianapolis, but only one third of them will line up for the classic 500 mile race on Memorial Day. A precious two weeks in early May before the mid-month qualifying trials are alternately filled with frantic activity and waiting as frequent spring showers interrupt track practice. The big names of championship racing are all back. National driving champion Mario Andretti, two-time Indianapolis winner A.J. Foyt, 1963 winner Parnelli Jones, road race star Dan Gurney, last year's Indianapolis winner Graham Hill of London, England, and Scotland's Jackie Stewart. Another Scot, Jimmy Clark, 1965 Indianapolis winner. Austria's Jochen Rindt is a rookie as far as this race is concerned, and so is Belgium's Lucien Bianchi. The Wynn Spitfire is a front engine car with front wheel drive. Spitfire's driver, Sammy Sessions of Nashville, Michigan, is a veteran of sprint, midget, and championship car racing. Even a skinny driver has to squeeze into an Indianapolis car. The wide tires that are now standard on Indianapolis cars were first introduced to the track in 1963 by Thompson. The next year, winner A.J. Foyt rode on them along with half of the field. Another Thompson innovation. One that is being tested in the wind Spitfire is four-wheel steering. The rear wheels turn in a slightly opposite direction to the front wheels to improve cornering at high speeds. In both cars, Thompson is trying out his new 540 horsepower V8 engines and the respective fuel injection systems. In famed gasoline alley, the strategy continues. Try it out, change it. And Mickey's cars, like 64 others at the track, are treated with winds. Mickey's other car, the Winds Charger, like almost all the others on the track, has its engine in the rear. Thompson introduced the first American rear engine car to qualify at Indianapolis in 1962. Mickey wants driver Gary Congdon's reactions to the Charger's new rubber suspension system. Congdon, from Garden Grove, California, is a 10-year veteran of sprints, midgets, and championship cars. After qualifying well for last year's 500, he was out of the race early, a victim of the historic 16-car accident. Mickey feels he has a special eye for drivers. He phrased star Dan Gurney to the Speedway in 1962, and he lured Graham Hill to the track, albeit tentatively, in 1963. However experienced or even famous a driver is, he must pass a test to drive at Indianapolis. Sammy Sessions takes a refresher test in the Spitfire. He must drive at speeds of 130, 135, 140, and 145 miles per hour for 10 laps each. He is not allowed to drop more than one mile per hour below a given speed or go more than four miles an hour above it. One hundred and sixty-two and a half miles per hour will prove to be the minimum qualifying speed. And the two wins cars will not quite make it. Missing by two tenths and seven tenths of a mile per hour. But it's a better show when cars miss more spectacularly.
They've all been trying to catch Mario Andretti, who again this year is turning the fastest practice laps on the track. Only the 33 fastest cars can start on race day, and they will line up in order of their achievement in the qualifications. Police report the biggest free race traffic jam in Indianapolis history as 225,000 spectators brave the rain to witness the first day of qualification. The rain does delay the trials, but it does not dampen the enthusiasm or the record breaking. The largest number of first day qualifiers yet is led off by Ronnie Duman, who was the last qualifier in 1966. Usual front runner Jim Clark qualifies slower than he did last year. Things liven up as Dan Gurney makes his four lap jaunt around the two and a half mile oval. He exceeds Mario Andretti's 1966 record qualifying speed with a 10 mile average of 167.224. But the moment of glory is short lived as Mario Andretti himself does the altogether expected with an average 168.982. Once again, the national driving champion earns the cover inside starting position for the race, the pole. A.J. Foyt's 166.289 average earns him the second row inside starting position, which he says is almost as good as the pole itself. Wally Dallenbach tries Indy for the first time and makes it. Parnelli Jones, driving a controversial and much feared aircraft turbine car, turns a 166.075 average to put him in the second row. Many drivers feel the car is unfair competition for piston engines. Defending Indianapolis champion Graham Hill has been having car trouble all month, and today is no exception. On the second qualifying weekend, New Zealander Dennis Holm makes his first Indy race. Jackie Stewart requalifies after being bumped from the lineup. But the best news for many comes when Graham Hill, switching to an untried car, makes it on the last day. If he hadn't, he would have been the first champion to fail to do so. As a late qualifier, he gets a back row starting position, but he's in the race. And a sad moment comes when Jim Hurtabies, the legendary Hercules of the racetrack, misses regaining a spot he lost in the lineup. Except for three hours of carburation tests, no more cars on the track till race day, one week hence. With one exception. Drivers, Ronnie Duman, Lloyd Ruby, and Gary Congdon with their protege, Offspring. May 30th, 1967, time for the 51st running of the Indianapolis 500 race. 250,000 people crowd the stands and infield despite a heavy possibility of rain. abreast in qualifying order. Five are driven by rookies, four by former winners. In the first two rows are the six top qualifiers, Mario Andretti, Dan Gurney, Gordon John Cox, A.J. Foyt, Joe Leonard, and Parnelli Jones. The pace car is driven by three-time winner Maury Rose. Now the pace lap. Wally Dallenbach is smoking. He could be called in if it keeps up.
Graham Hill, having trouble starting, finally catches up with no lap loss. The pace car pulls out. The race is on. And he zooms into a clear lead toward turn one. The others close in. Jones comes up on the outside. Jones passes Gurney and John Cock in the short shoot and comes out of turn one in second place. On turn two, coming onto the back stretch, Jones overtakes Andretti. And it's Jones leading, coming into turn three, followed by Andretti, Gurney, Boyd, and Don Cock. Coming back toward the main stretch, Jones is moving way ahead as cameras begin snapping away at racing history in the making. Nelly Jones a track record, 154.374 miles an hour. In one and a half laps, the field is taking on a whole new look. Gurney passes Andretti to take second. Foyt is fourth, John Cock fifth. Jones is averaging over 163 miles an hour in the second lap when the yellow flag signals caution. After Leroy Yarborough spins in the fourth turn. Gurney and Foyt fight it out in the turns for second places. Andretti seems to be slipping back. On lap four, Lloyd Ruby comes into the pits with a burned piston. He is the first man out of the race. Resume racing speeds. And Jones pours it on, overtaking the luckless Graham Hill in his ailing, trailing car. In the pits, it's Andretti on the eighth lap, in for a look at his slipping clutch. While Jones continues to lap other cars. Andretti rejoins the race while the Jones lead builds up. With Gurney and Foyt still battling into the corners. It is getting darker. There are sprinkles on the back stretch bringing out the yellow caution lights. Then it happens. Rain. It halts the race with 18 laps completed. There is a possibility that the intermittent drizzles will move on. But it becomes apparent Ready. they will not. Speedway rules state that an official race must be at least 250 miles. So, continue tomorrow, weather permitting. The second day makes this race Indy's longest 500. 175,000 spectators fill the stands and infield despite the end of the holiday and the 40% rain probability forecast. The car is offing order. The first five are Jones, Gurney, Foyt, Joe Leonard, and Al Unser. Mario Andretti starts today with a new clutch, but six laps behind. And Lloyd Ruby comes back to relieve George Snyder. We start your engine. A pace lap. Then it's for real as they start with the off with lap 19. diminishes and the crowd couldn't care less anyway as Parnelli Jones rips through the lap averaging 159.2. The Jones lead increases and Gurney builds quite an edge on Foyt. <laughs> Meanwhile back in the pack Mario Andretti is out to make up some of those lost laps. Jones is still turning record laps and Gurney is still chasing him. Andretti pours it on to lap other cars. 
clinging to some hope of finishing in the first 10. Graham Hill is less fortunate. Plagued with engine trouble, he makes his second unscheduled pit stop of the race and his last, thanks to a burned piston. Hill's teammate, Jim Clark, is having problems too, and he starts into the pits, just as Hill is making his goodbyes on foot. Lotus boards are having troubles this year, and Hills and Clark's qualifying difficulties were apparently just a preview. Clark is out, too, with piston trouble. But that doesn't change the race up front as Jones' turbine laps other cars with Gurney's Eagle Ford in hot pursuit. And backrunner Andretti believes in action, too. This race is being run at both ends. Jones about to lap Leroy Yarbrough. Miraculous control, but Jones loses his lead to Dan Gurney. The yellow flag is brief this time, and green is what Jones wants, and ready too. But he's out to recapture minutes, not seconds. Jones regains those seconds and starts rebuilding a comfortable lead. As the short-term leader, Gertie, slows down and makes an unscheduled pit stop. Fuel valve trouble. Andretti's only problem is that he's laps behind. And so is Gurney now after a five-minute pit stop. A bad break for builder driver Dan Gurney. Fortune soon strikes Mario Andretti. Andretti, who was surpassing the leader's speeds, six laps behind, loses his right front wheel. And the only running he's doing in the 65th lap is to catch it before it hurts somebody. With a yellow light on, Jones finds himself in the midst of the cars he's lapped. He comes in for his first scheduled pit stop on lap 76. Turbine uses kerosene fuel and a deflector keeps exhaust heat away. The pit stop puts Jones behind Foyt, who must pit soon. Twenty-four seconds complete. Almost. Oops, something's wrong. Hold it. He's pulled the fuel hose off. A confusion of spilled fuel as Parnelli Jones moves to regain the lead during Foyt's upcoming fuel stop. Carl Williams and Bob White tangle. Drivers aren't the only daredevils on the track. A heartbreaking setback for an important rookie, Art Pollard, who is running third. But nobody quits as long as the car runs. So back in he goes, but no more front running for today. Wally Dallenbach spins into the inside wall and stops practically opposite his pit, and the flag slows down the oncoming pack. Jones recaptures the lead during Foyt's first fuel stop. At mid-race, Jones is five seconds ahead of Foyt. Al Lunzer is third, and Cale Yarborough is replaced by Jackie Stewart in fourth. Bobby Unzer, Al's brother, is sixth. Dennis Holm gets up into fifth position. It's the yellow flag for Johnny Rutherford's crash. And Jochen Rinch, smoking all day, is not long for this race either. Boyd knows that Jones is almost due for a second fuel stop, and that now is the time to pour it on.
Meanwhile, Lloyd Ruby and Leroy Yarbrough head home on foot after a mid-race tangle. Jones tries to build a bigger lead on Foyt before coming into the pits. And when he does come in for fuel, some speculate on whether he will have a refueling problem because of his previous mishap. Foyt erases the 17-second lead and takes over, while Jones completes a trouble-free pit stop and rejoins the race still well ahead of third place Jackie Stewart and Plesky, both of whom came up from the back rows. Hoyt's interval on Jones is not enough to keep him in the lead after his mandatory second pit stop, and it is coming up very soon. Lap 148, and A.J. comes in for a second pit stop as required by the rules. Jones immediately regains the lead, and next time around is 15 seconds ahead. Boyd comes off the apron and rejoins the race alongside fifth place Al Unzer, who is still one lap behind him. Throughout the race, Jones and Boyd are topping speedway records established by Jimmy Clark in his 1965 win at Indianapolis. Four-fifths through the race, Arnie Knepper is flagged out for the smoking engine. And it's about that time for Jerry Grant and his Eagle Racer, followed shortly by Boss Eagle Dan Gurney. History repeats itself for Jackie Stewart, who stalled in practically the same spot last year while leading. This year he was third after having started 29th. Haley Yarborough and Mel Kenyon tangle and hit the wall. Bud Tinglestad goes to great lengths to avoid them. While Yarborough dashes over to Kenyon's car, leaving his own in good hands, Tinglestad rejoins the race. And Kenyon is about to as soon as Yarborough gets him strapped in. Kenyon gets a push from a truck while Yarborough rides home on one. Boyt is falling slightly behind despite the yellow light, and Jones's lead is better than 40 seconds. A tire lets go on fifth place Gordon Johncock. Leaving 17 cars running on the track by lap 195. Lap 196. Boyd trailing Jones by over 50 seconds. Then suddenly the race is headed for the most dramatic climax in Speedway history. Jones is moving slowly. A bearing failure in Jones's gearbox. Less than 10 miles from victory. The green light comes on again in Foyt's last lap, but just ahead of him on the main stretch, Bobby Grimm, Chuck Hulse, Carl Williams, Dan Bob Tinglestad, and Larry Dixon. Foyt slows down in the final turn as if by premonition. He weaves through the grinding five-car pileup to take the checkered flag and finishes the race alone. The other eight cars running are flagged off. Foyt averaged a record 151.207 miles an hour, despite one hour and four minutes of yellow caution light. It took him three hours, 18 minutes, and 24 seconds to ride the 500 miles, and he gets a record $171,000 for the trip. Foyt, with wife Lucy at his side, accepts the trophy for the third time, the fourth man to ever do so. Boyd's car, like seven of the other first ten cars in the race, was protected with wind.